I um, had been thinking all week about two different messages to preach. And um, worked on both of them a little bit. And I never got, never got any clearance on them. God never gave me any direction on them. And then finally, I think God said, no, don't preach those. And God directed me back to a passage of Scripture that I know I've mentioned several times in the past, oh, probably 10, 12 years. I've referenced it, referenced it often in sermons, teachings, the videos that we put online and so on. And I, so I thought, well, maybe God wants me to maybe kind of teach this again in a little bit different way. And I think that's the way that I'm going to do it. But I, I wasn't really thinking when I put all this together of what I was reminded of this morning. So I've told you I quit watching the news. I haven't watched. Uh, I haven't watched really any news local or otherwise, since the election. It, it just angers me. It angers me that we have a system of government that runs right now that is 100% okay with both cheating in an election and helping to cover up the cheating of that election. That comes from the judicial branch, the executive branch as far as state governors, the legislative branch, and then the media branch of our government. Because believe me, the media in this country is just as much a, a wing of our government now of a liberal, left-wing, lying, cheating government covering up, they're just as much a part of it as anything. So I just quit watching. My wife come in the other day, and I think it was Tuesday, and she said, you know, Reg Kelly has already canceled Wednesday night church. I said, why? She said, it's supposed to get freezing rain. And I'm going, I didn't know that. So I don't even watch the weather anymore. I just, I just don't do it. There are some news sites that I go to to try to keep up a little bit about what's going on. But somebody reminded me that this week, this week could be a turning point in our nation's future. Literally. Because, let me explain, on January 6th, Wednesday, the Electoral College representatives, they traveled to Washington, D.C., they cast their state's ballots for president. We already know that the key swing states are sending two different groups of electors. One group that is following the counted vote, which we know is fake. We know that they cheated. We have the video evidence. We have the electronic evidence. We have the testimony of people. And we have court cases where the Supreme Courts of these states just flat out refused to hear it because they didn't want that evidence brought to light. But then we have some brave people in those states, members of their state Congress, that have elected a different slate of electors. Those are both going to converge now on Washington, D.C. this Wednesday. Is that January 6th? Okay. We already know 
that there's going to be over a million people or more who believe Donald Trump should be president that's going to be in Washington, D.C. on that day. We can also almost, we can just pretty much figure out that Antifa and others are going to be there on the same day as well. Now, I don't know what the turnout's going to be. I don't know what the Congress is going to do. I don't know what the vice president is going to The vice president can pick whatever electors he wants. He's the president of the Senate, and he gets a choice in it. So I want you to think of it like this. If the Trump electoral votes go in Trump's way, then Trump will be the president for the next four years. And there's going to be a civil unrest. If Biden's group prevails and he gets selected against all the evidence as the next president, you're going to have over a million MAGA people with AR-15s who are going to be there. This is a troubling week. If you came to church to hear good news, I'm going to give you the good news that God's still in charge. He still reigns. Amen. But did not our Savior say a nation divided against itself cannot stand? Does our nation as it stands right now qualify as a nation divided against itself? It absolutely does. So, as I'm remembering this this morning, and I put this together yesterday, not thinking about, not really realizing that this week was the week when that was going to happen. When I thought about it this morning, I went, now it makes sense. Ephesians chapter 6. And I may just, this is one of those sermons that if I decide to let you out at 12 or 5 after 12, I can cut this off anywhere. Okay? But I thought about going back again, and I've done this before, of teaching things that I've taught in the past simply because, number one, maybe some people haven't heard of it. Or, number two, maybe often we need to be reminded of how the world and the universe actually work. Not the way the history professors at school taught you, not the way the public school system taught you, but how the universe works and how things work in this country and around the world the way God says it works. Because we're reminded in Ephesians chapter 6 of one extremely important issue. And that is angels and devils cannot be shot down with AR-15s. They just like go right, like Casper the Friendly Ghost, they just go right through them. So our weapons of warfare, the real war that's going on, are, those weapons are not carnal weapons. Carnal means of the flesh. A bullet can impact the flesh, but a bullet cannot impact the spirit. And that's what we're going to be reminded of today, that God teaches us in his word what is really going on in this country. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there are people in countries all over the world that want Donald Trump to be the president of the United States again. Why? Because he's the guy that actually pushed back against the corrupt system. Is there corruption in other countries? Yes. And they're hoping that America will lead the charge against unrighteous government 
all over the world. They're hoping that this nation will continue on the course that it started four years ago. Now, you're nev you've never heard me say, and you're never going to hear me say, until I know that Donald Trump has actually done this. The man's never bowed at any altar that I've ever known and asked Jesus into his heart and asked God to save him. But I will remind you that God has used faulty men, flawed men, including lost men, to do exactly what he wanted done before. This is not the first time it's ever happened. Ephesians chapter 6. So, if you don't like Trump, or you do like Trump, I want you to understand what's going on far beyond Donald Trump. And where the real battleground is. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the... He did not say Second Amendment. I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe strongly in the Second Amendment. I believe so strongly in it. I bought an AR-15. Brian gives me a little, it looks like a bullet, but it's got a laser in it. And you put it in the barrel of your AR, and that's how you change your sights. The laser shoots straight down the barrel of that gun. And you adjust your sight to wherever the laser. So I did that the other day. I finally put it in my gun. It's jammed. I can't get it out. My gun's useless now. You know how to get it out? I'll bring it. So I ain't got one now to fight with. I'll borrow Dave's. All right. And I got lots of ammo too, but I got nothing. I throw the ammo at somebody, but I can't. He's, he said, be strong. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And let me tell you something. There will be some people who would be fighting on the same side as us who are not saved. And I'll tell you, if we lose this battle, we can still be strong in the Lord. The real battle that we're fighting will never be lost. You understand that? The real battle that we're going to fight and are fighting now, we can't lose it. Because God has already guaranteed us the victory. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. That's a whole nother sermon series. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of who? Joe Biden? Kamala Harris? Communist Chinese Communist Party? Russians? Venezuelans? No. United Nations? No. The devil is our enemy. You cannot shoot the devil with guns. Then he tells us. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So ask yourself, this is an easy question. With all of these people all working together against what we see as right and righteous in this country, do you think there is a spirit behind that? Do you think there is a spirit that is promoting those people to do and act the way they're doing. Yes. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, and he lists them off here, and I want you to look up at the screen because I've counted them off for you. Four of them, four groups of spirits. And you understand that in God's kingdom, in the world, there are good spirits, Angels, and there are bad spirits, devils. The Bible still in some places calls them angels, but it calls them evil angels. They're called devils, they're called spirits, they're called unclean spirits, they're called familiar spirits, they're called um, uh, evil angels, they're called gods with a little g, 
They're, they go by different terms and different names. But here is now the Holy Spirit through Paul giving you the categories that these devils operate under. It's like they have an army and they have certain divisions. Who, who's been, who's our military guys? Who was in the military? Joe, what did you specialize in? What was your, did you, was you are in, was you a, uh, did you work on tanks? Did you fly airplanes? Did you just shoot a gun? Field artillery. Field artillery. That was his specialty. Other people in other branches of the service have different areas that they operate in. So if they needed somebody to work in field artillery, they sent Joe. If they needed somebody who specialized in blowing up bridges, then they would send somebody who knew how to blow up bridges before they blew themselves up. That would be me. So he lists them. Principalities. Powers. Rulers of the darkness of this world. And then spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's pray. You help me preach this morning. Father, I need your help. I need your grace. It's a very, very troubling time we're living in right now. Father, I have no idea what's going to happen this afternoon, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen Wednesday. Lord, I know one thing is I'll be on my knees. Father, I don't. You told us to pray for our government. You told us to pray for those that were in power. That we may live a quiet and a peaceable life. But Father, just as our nation faced in 1776, 1860, 1941, and now again today... There comes a time when it's no longer possible for us to live in peace. Because we are being attacked by forces in this world that so far they seem to have everything on their side. But they are lacking one thing on their side. And that's you. And Father, this church and these people, we believe in and we stand for what's right. Even if, Father, even if, if most of this church was Democrats and we wouldn't have voted for Trump, Father, it's wrong, it is wrong to cheat in an election. It doesn't matter whose favor it goes in. It would be wrong, and I would be saying it, if I found out Donald Trump cheated in this election, I would be against him. There are things that are right, and there are things that are wrong, and I will never stand on the side of wrong. I never will. Your Holy Spirit, our Savior Jesus Christ, you as our God and all of the holy angels that are in heaven are always on the side of what's right. You said in your word that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so, Father, I pray, dear God, that right would win. We know the battleground is not physical. And Father, we know and understand that no matter what happens this week, no matter what happens January 20th, no matter what happens in the next four years, the people who have done wrong in this country will pay for it with their eternal souls. They will be judged. As will we if we ever find ourselves on the side of wrong. Father, give us help. Help us to understand, Lord, what you want to teach us. 
Father, I believe this is what you laid on my heart to say and to speak this morning. And I pray, dear God, that it would be a blessing, that it would help somebody, it would encourage them, Father. It would at least instruct us and let us know what is happening in this world. We ask your blessings on it. Father, I have nothing to give these people. So, Father, would you come into this place this morning and preach the message that these people need to hear. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, we have, again, we have four different groups of devils. Each of them operate in a different scenario, in a different area. And one or all four may be working in your life today. Let's take things like rulers of the darkness of this world. Let's say that right now in your life, you're going through an issue where the lamp and the light of God's word is not shining at all in your life. Let's say that it's been a week or better or a month or a year since you read your Bible. Let's say that you used to read the Bible all the time and here lately you find that everything comes in the way and you're not reading the Bible. Psalm 119 said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So let's say that in your life, now that the light of the word of God is missing from your life, now there's darkness. Are there things in this world that only show up in the dark? Are there animals that live in the forest that only come out at night? Do you hear noises in your house or outside that at night that you never hear during the daytime? Amen? You see what I'm saying? If, if there is any kind of creature in this world that loves darkness, when there's darkness in your life, they are going to show up then and they are going to trouble you. And their job is to destroy you while it's still dark. Does it make sense? So let's say that could be happening in your life right now. But let's deal with the first one today, and that is principalities. It has the word prince in it, and it's that way for a reason. Isaiah chapter 9 when the Bible mentions a prince, we use that term like we're used to saying like a prince is the son of a king or a queen. As in England, uh, Charles is prince because he's next in line to the throne. But Elizabeth II uh, is the queen. So Charles cannot be named king. He can only be named prince. And that's not really how the word is used in the Bible. A prince in the Bible is also a king. It is somebody who is in charge. Somebody who is in authority. Somebody who rules over a group of people or a certain territory or whatever. They are governing spirits. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, it's a prophecy of Christ for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the government, notice this, the government shall be upon his shoulder, meaning that Christ carries the burden of governing this entire universe. Let me ask you a question. Right now, do you think Christ is still in charge of everything? Amen. He is. There is nothing. I guarantee you, there is nothing that happens in this world except God, Jesus Christ, allows it to happen. That was proven to us in the days of Job. Remember when Satan wanted to attack Job? The first time Satan goes to God, he asked permission of God, meaning God was in charge. God, I want to attack Job because I think he's serving you because you made him rich. God said you can, you can affect his family, you can take away his riches, but you cannot touch his body. Meaning that God was in charge. The second time around, Job is still worshiping God. God. He goes to God to ask permission. God, can I afflict his body? God says, yes, you can afflict his body. You just cannot kill him. God was still reigning over even the devil himself. The devil had to get permission before he could do anything. 
God is always in control. Somebody say amen. So let's, let's think about this for a minute. If they select Joe Biden to be the president for the next four years, more than likely he won't last. I don't think the guy can tie his own shoes anymore. Camel Harris will be the next president. She is an extremist, liberal, Christian-hating, baby-hating, righteousness-hating, liberal. And with the powers that certain governments have in certain states because of the China virus, she will compound that and if it was left up to her, she'd shut down every church in this country. Okay? You might say, God will never let that happen. Oh, yes, he will. So my question to you is, even if those two end up running the government, can we still serve our God to the very end of our lives. Yes, we can. I don't want to live in a communist government. I don't want to live under a socialist government. But if God chooses to put me under one, I will live and I will preach this gospel and I will carry on until the day that I die because I am wrestling principalities. By the way, the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We know that when Jesus comes back, he's going to establish a kingdom for a thousand years on the earth. He is going to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace, meaning that he is going to be in charge. Now... Let's take that and apply that to some areas of life. Um, turn to Ezekiel 28. And I, as you're turning there, I want you to think of areas of authority. Now, some of the things I'm going to say, you might be new-fashioned instead of old-fashioned. Well, I'm old-fashioned. And by the way... I'm not just old-fashioned because I like to be old-fashioned. There are things that I believe simply because they are what the Bible tells me. I believe that at a McDonald's restaurant, the person who owns the McDonald's restaurant is the boss. Am I right on that? They're the boss. And those bosses have books that they have had either written up by the corporate organization or they themselves as owner of the franchise on how everything goes. Matthew, you worked at McDonald's. Was there any way that you could make a hamburger any other way other than the way the book said to make the hamburger? Now, if somebody said, I want mine rare, could you cook it up rare for them? You're not allowed to. Why? It's in the book. The book said you had to cook them through and through. I worked it. I lasted working at McDonald's two days. That's all I could handle. But in those two days, I learned how to sear a McDonald's hamburger. And I learned... That there's a certain number of minutes that they had to, this is back before they had to press. Certain number of minutes they could be on one side, certain number of minutes they could be on the other side. How much salt? They even had, they even have the ketchup and the mustard pre-measured. And like a caulking gun. You hit the button and a certain exact amount of ketchup comes out, exact amount of mustard comes out, and that's it. The guy who owns the McDonald's is the one in charge. You might think that you can do it better than him. 
or that you, your way of making the burger is better. And I don't know why anybody likes this kind of hamburger. The one that I make surely will be better. So I'm going to make the company better by cooking the burgers my own way. Is that right? Can you do that? So if you can't even do that at a McDonald's restaurant, what makes you think you can do that in a marriage? It's awfully quiet. Now, I am, I am two things when it comes to marriage. Number one, somebody has to be the head of the household. It was God who said it was the man. It wasn't me. But number two, men, you're an idiot if you don't listen to your wife every now and then. You're not the smartest egg in the basket. There are things that you will get wrong every time unless you listen. Let me tell you what the Bible says. God created the man first, did he not? But why did he create the wife? Because he said, it ain't good for the man to be left alone to himself. Is it? Is it, Matthew? Not good. God says, I will make and help meet for him, meaning... She will be the other half of the way he sees the world. And any husband who thinks they're in total command, who will not listen to their wife, you're the one that's wrong, not her. Amen? I don't care if you say amen or not. That's what the Word of God says. Yeah, amen. Let me tell you how God dealt with me on this issue. He dealt with me by making my wife quit her job and working here at the church with me. She worked for me. And I was not prepared for that. And what God did was God taught me, Mike, you're not the only one who can think in this family. I gave you a wife because you're not as smart as you think you are. And she'll see things and know things that you will never get unless you get it from her. And I'm going to make it that way. But, I, and you can look at any situation in the Bible. Look at um, the story of Esther. King Ahasuerus was the man in charge, but he was going to have every Jew killed had it not been for Esther counseling him in the right direction. Amen? But who was still the king? Ahasuerus. Now let me explain to you how principalities work. And then you'll see now what's going on in this country. There are things about Donald Trump's character and his lifestyle that I absolutely despise. He's arrogant. He, is, he, was a, he was a billionaire playboy, a womanizer, and a partier. And for that, I probably would have never picked him. But one of the things that I knew about him was that he didn't owe anybody any favors. He certainly wasn't doing it to get rich like other politicians were. And I honestly felt like, and he has demonstrated in the last four years, that he is going to rule by the Constitution and by the law. In this country, it's not the executive branch or the congressional branch or the judicial branch that's in charge of the nation. It's a book called the Constitution. That is where the final authority exists. Husbands, when it comes to your role as an authority over your wife and family, you actually have guidelines that you must 
follow. And they're in this book. And if you will not lead your family by this book, then a principality spirit has come in and taken over your household. Ezekiel 28. Look at this. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. Now this verse is to two different entities. Number one, the man who was the king of the nation of Tyrus. That's the, the primary target. But the real target was a spirit that ruled over the people of the land of Tyrus. There is a spirit, an angel, that governs over a territory. And you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a dog wet on a tree? Why do they do that? What are they doing? Marking their what? Their territory. Lions do it. Dogs do it. Deer do it. Animals all over the world. They mark their domain and say, this is my area. Stay out. I'm in charge here. Does that make sense to everybody? There is a devil that rules over the city of Festus. A spirit. There's one that rules over the whole country. An evil spirit that is trying to move this country out from underneath the authority of the Constitution. And replacing that with some other rule. A, and I guarantee you that rule will take away our right to own guns and our right to keep and carry Bibles. Notice this, son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Now, stop here for a minute. If you're a husband and you see yourself as God Almighty, over your wife and over your children. That means that you think the Bible is hogwash and you don't have to do what it says and you can rule over them however you want to. And let me tell you what a husband, and I know this from experience because I know some guys who saw themselves as gods over their family. A husband that sees himself as a god over his wife will think nothing of beating his wife. Why? Because he thinks he doesn't have to follow God's rules. Husbands, do you know what God says about what happens when you get angry at your wife? Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. That's a pretty good rule, isn't it, guys? Is it possible for a wife to ever make a husband mad? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> but I don't have total rule over my marriage. The book does. And if I ever find myself bitter or angry at my wife, I'll give you another rule. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. See how it's connecting us together? God's always in charge. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So if I saw myself as being God over my wife and family, then I would be prone to slap my wife, beat my wife, 
beat my kids mercilessly. By the way, there's even a rule on how fathers should deal with their children. Fathers, love your children. Provoke not your children to anger. You know what an abusive dad will do? He'll beat his kids just because he's mad. And those kids will grow up hating him. So, this is a husband. Right here, look, look, look back here in Ezekiel 28. I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So it doesn't matter if it's a husband over a family, or, here I'll apply it like this, a pastor over a church. You see, if I didn't have rules that govern me in this book, but there are. Actually, I'm supposed to treat the church like I'm supposed to treat my wife. I'm supposed to be gentle and long-suffering with my church. I'm not supposed to be bitter against my church. And I, I know a pastor. I know a guy who's been in the ministry all his life. He's lasted almost three years at any church he's ever pastored. Almost three years he's lasted at any church. He's pastored dozens of churches. And I know the guy. Do you know what his problem is? He's always ticked off at his church why they won't do anything. Why they won't get up and make the church big enough so they could support him and give him a raise. And he's, uh, every time you talk to him, he's having problems with his church. So he leaves that church and goes to another one. I mean, I can see a guy who gets married once and things don't work out and there's a divorce and he gets married again and then things, things work. But when a guy is on his fifth wife, to me, the problem is with the guy and not the five wives. Does that make sense? That pastor wouldn't do it God's way. He saw himself as God ruling over that congregation. There's videos on YouTube, I've seen them. A pastor calling people out by name and calling them, he wasn't cursing, but he was so abusive to them in front of everybody. Thinking that those people had the right, they, they had to listen to him or they weren't saved. That's wicked. That's principalities. That man has a spirit on him that makes him think that he's God over those people. And what he's done is that he has replaced biblical authority with his own authority. Or maybe, maybe, you, maybe you have a boss that doesn't, Matthew, follow the book. And he just rules however he wants to. He's making passes at all the ladies, all the girls. That's against the law now. Amen? Whereas that used to be, that just used to be how it was years ago. That's now against the law. Anybody in authority who will trade in biblical God's righteous authority for his own authority, there is a devil that put that in his mind and caused that. So now, let's look at our nation. Let me keep reading in Ezekiel 28. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom, with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. Let me ask you a question. Dave, let me ask you a question. Why does Joe Biden want to be president again? Why does he want back in the White House? Money. Money. Right? Why did Hillary want to be in the White House in 2016? It was proven that once she got out as Secretary of State, the Clinton Foundation donations dropped dramatically. 
And her hope was to get into the White House so that the Clinton Foundation, which is their charitable organization, you know, it's the money they give to all the orphans in Haiti, that those donations, or those, excuse me, those kickbacks would fall back into place. Do you not see that here in this passage? With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. That's what principalities are. Principalities are any spirit that seeks to remove God's authority having it replaced and trading it in for something that's corrupt. And let me tell you, this week, this week will determine which spirit will be allowed to rule over the United States of America. In 1776, did we want a king No. In 2020, do we want a king? Do we want a king ruling over us? Do we want one group or one single uh, federal authority to rule over everybody in the nation telling them all what to do? No, we don't want that. That's the reason why we have a constitution that gives us separation of powers. So that if Illinois won't let you carry a gun outside on your waistband, Missouri will. Amen. Amen. So this is why we don't live in Illinois. And we live in Missouri because of... Did you get him? See, we got a wasp trying to take over authority here. It's a principality. Okay. This is, this is what's going on. And this week will determine what spirit reigns over America. An evil spirit that will seek. Does Gavin Newsom have the right to make all the churches in California shut down and not be able to sing? He does not have that right, but he thinks he has that right. If it wasn't for the Supreme Court stepping in and overruling him, it wouldn't just be Gavin Newsom. And if the people get in the White House who I'm afraid are going to get in the White House, they will try to make it mandatory that all the churches shut down permanently. We won't. We won't. For those of you visiting, we've already had the COVID virus run through this church with devastating effects. But we decided that we would rather have church than be afraid of either what a virus would do or what the government might want us to do. We're still going to have church. Even if it costs us everything we have. We're still going to keep doing it. Because we realize we're not fighting Jefferson City. The county executive in Hillsborough. We're not fighting the Democrats. We're not fighting Joe Biden. We're not fighting Kamala Harris. We're fighting the spirits that are behind them doing what they're doing. And those spirits aren't intimidated by how much AR-15 ammunition you have. They're not scared by that. But let me tell you what they are afraid of. They're afraid of a person who believes that this book is the final authority on everything. And they're afraid of someone who carries on them the blood of Jesus Christ. And they're afraid of someone who can cry out to God and say, God, 
I want it your way. I want your will to be done in my country, in my state, in my church, in my family, and in my life. I want the King of Kings to rule right here. We may lose the country. That doesn't mean that you have to lose your soul by yielding to it. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Bow your heads in safety because the wasp has been killed. This is the war that's going on. This is the battle that we're facing. And I've got a lot more to give you on this, but I told you that if it got going too long, I'd let you out. I can cut it off anywhere. To all of you husbands, those who are here, those who are watching online, those who live in Kenya. To all you pastors who are listening to us on Watchman FM radio. Pastors, if you're not ruling your church by God's way, you have a spirit, you have a principality on you. He needs to be got rid of. Husbands. All across America. And I would say it's a big problem in Kenya. Husbands, if you beat your wives, you're a wicked person. There is a devil ruling over you because you think that you're God over your family and you're not. God's word gives you authority and he gives you the rules to live by. He tells you to love your wife, not be bitter against her. Anybody that's in any kind of authority, do it God's way. Father, we come before you today. And I don't know, Father, all the reasons why you had me preach this today. I do know, Lord, that we are facing one of the most critical times in our nation's history. And it's very possible that a war, a physical war, could break out. People are asking me, should we get involved in that? Should we fight that war? I don't know. What I do know is the real battle against the spirits that are behind it. We should always be fighting them. And God, I've learned from your word that it doesn't take a hundred million prayer warriors or even a million people praying to save a country. Father, I've learned from your word that it just takes one. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the Bible says. Father, I'd like for righteousness to reign in my country for my children's sake, for my grandchildren's sake. I'd like for this nation to be turned around. I'd like for all the people, Father, who have been guilty of crimes to go to jail. Father, I'd like for myself to be a husband that ruled by the book. To love my wife and to love my family. Not provoking my children to anger. But leading them in righteousness. Showing them, Father, by my example, how to live their lives. I'd like to show my church that I love them, that I'm not bitter against them, that I care about them more than I care about myself, to follow the rules that you've given me as I rule over these people. Father, I pray, dear God, that the word that's gone forth from this pulpit today, Father, you carry it to each and every man, woman, child, 
each and every person, dear God, and apply it as you see fit in their lives. Help us, dear God, to fight the devil every day. Because every day he's going to fight us. Teach us how to live. Teach us how to live right. Teach us how to fight these evil, dark spirits that want to destroy our nation, our families, our churches. And thank you, God, that we can always have the victory through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet?